my career in entertainment. Um, I used to be a newsreader in the Midland area uh, for a couple of years. And at first I was kind of a proper new, well, I was trying to be a proper newsreader. Uh, and I wasn't very good. In fact, I was absolutely hopeless. Um, and they gave me the sort of the lighter interview. So I did the upside down beer drinker, a man who used to swallow live goldfish. Um, I did a man walking from Worcester to Evesham, a distance of 13 miles with four ferrets down his trousers. Uh, and after a mile, they bit him. Uh, I did stuff like that. And actually, I thought, I'm very happy here. And because I was your sort of long haired, zany young local reporter, and I was around the building. Um, they gave me this thing, a Saturday morning thing, called Today is Saturday, Watch and Smile, um, which sort of changed my life. And there was a weird period where Monday to Friday I was doing sort of comparatively heavy news, and occasionally it'd be like a big bus crash or something. And then Saturday I was doing Tiswas, rolling about in custard. Uh, and they did say to me, after a couple of years of doing Tiswas, I said, there's a credibility, there's a credibility gap here. And, you know, in the end, you've got to do bus crushes or you've got to do, you know, buckets of water and beans and things. And I thought, well, I think it's beans for me. And it changed my life. I mean, completely changed my life. And, you know, for me and Lenny and Sally and Spit the Dog and all of us, it just, you know, went off into another planet. So, and there were fantastic days. I mean, we had the best fun. And I did, I think, seven years of that. Um, then I did the adult version with Lenny and co. We did the you know, the grown-up version. We just didn't want to be rolling around in custard till we were 60. Um, so I did OTT, which is it's kind of a legend. It was this late-night, live, improvised show. We got, I mean, I was the producer. I got sl Every Monday, I'd be taken into the controller's office and just slant all over the carpet for about three years. It got huge ratings. Midnight, this is back in 1981 or whatever, midnight on a Saturday night on ITV, we used to get something like 14, 13.5 million. But the, there was no sort of, I don't know, there were, there were so many complaints about it. All the papers were ripped. First time I'd ever really had, you know, adverse criticism. We were slagged in every paper. When will OTT be OFF and all this stuff? Um, and I thought at that point, I thought, I think the career now might be going into a sort of a bit of a siding. Um, and actually, I did some work for the BBC, which was good fun. I then discovered the joys of radio, which is just the best fun, and changed my life. And I did the next 20 years at Capital Radio, which I loved. Um, I joined TVAM. I worked with the likes of Anne Diamond and Roland Rat. And that was a great year, actually. Greg Dyke was the boss man, and Greg was the best fun to work with. And then I did things like Tarrant on TV, and obviously Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. You know, I've never really stopped working, and now I'm going all around the world doing Railways of the World or whatever. So I've never really slowed up, but it's, it's been good. I've had a nice time. I think that an audience does grow with you, like they did with someone like Terry Wogan, bless him. You know, they are, they've been with you forever and they kind of know what you're like. Um, I still, if I do an after dinner and I do a Q&A, bearing in mind I've done so much stuff since, uh, and Tizzle was finished in 1981, the first question will always be about Tizzle, always. And somebody asks somebody daft about Spit the Dog or Sally James, did you ever? No, I didn't, etc., etc. Um, and you think, this is a show that finished nearly 40 years ago now, 35 years or whatever. Um, Tis Was is just kind of etched in people's memories, and those who were around then and alive then, it kind of changed people's lives. But you can now get, I was talking to Lenny Henry about this, you can get like a university thesis now in Tis Was, and they analyse it and discuss it and try and work out, you know, what my political motivation was. We just hated Blue Peter. That's the only reason we did it. We hated Blue Peter. We were young lads and Sally, and we mucked about for eight years of our lives. And it, it seemed to strike a strange chord. And it changed my life. No question it changed my life. I've had the best fun. I mean, I, I have had so many laughs doing what I do. On set, off set, behind the set, whatever. I've met so many mates. I have had a brilliant time doing radio and doing television. And I cannot imagine what else I could do. I'm completely unemployable. I can't hammer a nail into a into a plank. I had so many laughs. I suspect, I mean, my kid, my son now is working in television. I suspect they will never have the same fun we had because it was very much, I mean, Tiswas would not happen now. Tiswas would just, it, it would be impossible because of health and safety and, you know, all the stuff about children crying and all that stuff. You know, we never wanted to make children cry, but they do. They cry at children's parties. You know, you don't get ban all parties. Uh, it was chaos, but it was good chaos. 
I had the best fun. I think when I got into sort of, I think when I got into radio, I'd had so many problems with unions. In the, in the 70s, the unions made television almost impossible to make. And I was producing stuff as well. I had, you know, I have to sort of sign the docket that I want to pick up a bucket of water and how many inches of water. This is back in about 1976. We had so many problems with the unions making it almost impossible. And then the world kind of changed and actually it changed then almost too much. So now you get just one guy with a camera and sound and lights and all that, you know, and it's, it's almost gone the other way. I don't think people have the fun making television like they used to. I don't think they have the fun making radio now that they used to. The accountants are in, you know, there's all these people analysing what you say and who you upset and, oh, God, you can't say that. For the likes of me and Everett and Cohen and Wogan, we never had that. We just said the first silly thing that came into our head. We weren't trying to offend people, you know, but... So I don't think it's the fun now probably for kids starting in the industry uh, as it was and there's all sorts of you know garbage reality shows and stuff i still get asked about every week there's some great new reality show you know i don't want to spend an evening milking a cow with kerry katona no i really don't but in amongst it all there's still there's still wonderful drama and you know there's great presenters you know it's the thing now when we started it was like bbc one ITV one, and that was it, and then BBC two came in, whatever. Now there's hundreds of channels to choose from, you know. So if you want to get on the telly, you can. But it's, I think it's kind of lost the prestige. When I grew up, there were only a handful of famous people. There really weren't very many famous people at all. Now there's millions of them. And to be honest, most of the time I turn on the telly, I've no idea who you are. And also I don't care. I think the first time I went to Fountain, it wasn't called Fountain. I think it was called Limehouse. And I did some... I think I did TV Scrabble at Limehouse with Paul Smith, funnily enough, who went on to own Celador and kind of changed my life. I think it was the first thing I did. And then I did some Tarrant on TVs up there. Um, and then, for no particular reason, except they were there and they were handy and they had a nice big studio, we did the first ever Millionaire there. Um, and I mean, I still remember that night. I don't think I realised then just how big Millionaire was about to become. Um, you know, we had no comprehension it was going to go to 120 countries around the world and all this stuff and the, you know, Oscar-winning movie and all that stuff. And it, I mean, it changed game shows forever, really. It was just, you know, beyond anybody's comprehension. But I do remember, and I don't get particularly nervous normally before telly shows, but just before we went on air, I just said to my, my missus and my agent, can you guys just go out? Which I never normally did. So can you, and I spent about 10 minutes in Fountain just sort of, just sort of walking up and down the carpet a bit, so I must have been quite screwed up. I, I sort of realised it was a big show, and I had no idea quite how big it was going to be. I thought we'd get three good years, um, and actually it changed my life forever. And I do remember after the first one, the next morning I was walking up to the Hilton, up the, up the road at Wembley. And bear in mind, only one show had gone out the night before, only one ever, of 600 and odd that followed. And a guy wound his window down, a big guy in a truck, and he went, Hey, Chrissy, phone a friend. And I thought, that's only ever been out once, that show. And phone a friend is already in the sort of public parlance. And actually, it's now 17 years or something since that day. And even now, like this morning, on my way here, Chrissy, phone, phone a friend. It's just changed the world. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm immune to it. We also did, we also did Man O' Man at Fountain, the second series at Fountain. And it was something like 200 women and 10 blokes. I mean, it was such a lot. When, when Millionaire really took off and I was doing Capital Radio and Millionaire, they were saying, why are you still doing Man and Man? I said, because it's just the best laugh. These poor blokes, they came out all macho, macho. And very quickly, these women just reduced them to rubble. These guys' egos sort of shrink, shrink, shrink. And they're all going in the pool. They used to throw these guys in the pool. And that. It was quite vicious. Um, I do remember. I do remember once this particular guy, and he's got all his gear on, and they're all just shouting, "We can see you, Willie! We can see you!" And this guy's like horrified. And for some reason, when they did the seating plan, they put fifty of Glasgow's finest had all been drinking for hours coming over from Glasgow, next to fifty of Essex's finest. And it, I mean, it was like a football match. This fist fights, literally a fist between these girls. And they're getting up and slagging each other with their sharpened stilettos and all this stuff. And it was, there was blood coming out. And of course, Fountain didn't have sort of hardcore security people. They had some poor little old boy who came in, 
No, no, girls, all calm down. Fuck off and all that. It was, um, I loved it. I loved Man Oh Man. Yeah, I think having been to Fountain a few times before, I think it was just such an adventure. The whole millionaire thing just went through the roof and everybody, I mean, everybody in the building was like, ah, oh, that contestant last night, or oh, what's happening tonight and all that. I mean, everybody, we were just, everybody in Fountain was working with us, for us, for millionaire. And from the, you know, the chef to the girls in the office, everybody was just doing this one production, which is kind of rare now. You get a London weekend or something, it's just next, next, next. But it was great. It was a great short period of my life. I mean, it's a shame it wasn't longer, to be honest. We were very happy there. I mean, most of what happens to you in television, radio is luck. And I was kind of in the right place at the right time. But David Briggs, who devised Millionaire, worked with me for 15 years on Capital was my sort of best mate. We were joined at the hip. We do kind of talk like each other almost. We're very much, we think the same as well. So he had an idea on radio called Double the Quits. And he went through about two years, Briggs. He, after, he left Capital and went off to seek his fortune in the big bad world of TV. And actually it's difficult to imagine now with his various yachts or whatever around the world, but actually he struggled for quite a long time. And he kept saying to me, I've got this one, this sort of germ of an idea. I want to take Double or Quits and turn it into some sort of TV format. If I get that together, and if anybody picks up the option to try and make it, would you do a pilot? And I actually remember saying to him, I'm really busy, I'm up to my ears doing all sorts. I'll do a pilot, but I don't think I want to do the series. This is a millionaire, which probably changed all our lives. I was just like too busy to think about it. And I did the pilot with him, and, um, and that was great. And we did that at Fountain. We did the pilot. And really and truly, my bits didn't change much from the beginning, from the very first pilot to the second one. It was about a week later. And what they did, they changed all the music. So the lighting, all that duh, duh, duh. Because originally we had, um, we talking about this the other day, we had a Pete Waterman song, which sounds naff now, but it was one of those sort of songs you had, that sort of double, your money. We had one of those songs about never needing to work again and being so wealthy and living a fabulous life as a millionaire. We had one of those songs and some, somebody suddenly said, that's so dated. Get rid of that, change all the lightings and basically frighten people. You know, like make it really dark and kind of, you know, it's a million quid, so sh they should have to work hard. I mean, Paul Smith used to say to me, you know, there, there is lots of pleasure in winning lots of money. There is also pain, and you are the pain. I went, thanks for him. But I, I kind of know what he meant, so all that, are you sure, and all that stuff. That came from, from that. But really, the first pilot of Fountain to the second one, things didn't change much. And then we came on air at Wembley in September, and it just, the world changed forever. I mean, the world changed forever. All game shows around the world have changed completely, you know, because of Millionaire. The Americans came in. They were the first to come across, and then the Australians, the Indians, and now 120 countries or whatever. But it revolutionised everything about television, about the idea of being sold around the world. I mean, that didn't happen before. A very odd show might be shown in Australia or something. Everybody now makes a show and thinks immediately about how many countries can I sell it to. That didn't happen before, before we started Millionaire, really. I think I owe Fountain a lot because they made it possible for me to expand and fulfil my own abilities, whatever they were, and they made it very easy so that that side of it was sorted. Because you don't want to be worried about technical stuff, we've got enough to think about, like with new shows and whatever. And they, they're a lot to do with my own success of my own career, and I'm very grateful.